Hello everybody, today I wanted to try something different. I'm going to force myself to play five games I've never played before out of this collection behind me. The reason I want to do this is to force myself to play the games that I've spent money on over these years. I don't want these things to sit back and get dusty. This is a great opportunity because right now I'm kind of at a pause in regards to game playing. I have played some PS3 games recently. I've played some Killzone 2. Uh, the online multiplayer has been restored on this, so I ended up playing that for about nine months, but I've moved on from that. I played a little bit of Warhawk online. That's also been restored. And I've been dabbling in Demon's Souls, the original edition here. But I kind of want to get back to my roots. At this point in the video, I do not know what the five new games are going to be. I'm going to pick them out in front of you in a few moments here. I'm hoping that I like some of those games, and if I do, I'll continue to play them well past the posting of this current video. But for today, I'm just going to post my initial impressions and give you basically five mini reviews of these five games. So let's go ahead and pick the games. Okay, so let's get started. I do want to play at least one Genesis game, so let's look at the collection here and I'll see if anything sticks out. Hmm. Blades of Vengeance. I've never played that before. Yeah. We'll count that as a candidate. I'm going to leave it sticking out like that. And... Let's see. I definitely don't want to play a strategy game like Defender of Rome here because uh, this is going to take too long for me to learn to put it in this video and it's probably going to be boring for the viewer. Let's see. I don't think I've played Demolition Man. Yeah, doesn't look too bad. We'll leave that as a candidate. Now, I do want to get into the Strike series. So, Desert Strike. Which one was, was this the first one? I can't remember. Let's leave that as a candidate. I did check Wikipedia and Desert Strike is the first in the series, followed by Jungle Strike, which is right here. So we'll keep Desert Strike as a candidate because I've never played any game in the series so I might as well start with the first one. I have to look at these and just sort out in my brain which ones I've played and which ones I haven't. I would say I'm mostly interested in Desert Strike so let's add that one to the list. And I'll just lay it down here I guess. I'm going to keep Blades of Vengeance nominated in case I can't find some other game to play. So now I'm thinking about getting a Dreamcast game, which is going to be hard because I have played most of these. But let me see if anything sticks out. I'm trying to get that reflection to go away. Shadow Man. I've been interested in this before, so it's the kind of Dreamcast game I could see myself playing to completion. Let's keep that as a candidate. See what else we got here. Gundam Side Story. That might be interesting as well. It's a mech game. Eh, let's keep that as a candidate. Then we got a game called Incoming. And this looks like a fake cover. And it just looks like a shooter of some sort. I think I'm going to pick this one. So these other ones I'll get to at some point. But let's add this to the pile. Since I've picked two different games for two different Sega systems, I feel the need to pick a Nintendo game. And I think I'll go up and look at the Super Nintendo games. So I'm going to climb this stepladder and see what we got up here. Hopefully it's not too dark for you. All right, a game I haven't played before. There's War 2410. That seems interesting, but 
I think it's a strategy game, which would not be good for this video. Starfleet Academy seems intriguing, but I think that might be a little bit slow and I don't know. I'm kind of not in the mood for that. We got Lawnmower Man. That's supposed to have some good graphics. Kirby's Avalanche. I've never played that, I don't think. Super Chase HQ. Top Gear. Super James Pond. What about this Aerobiz? What's that about? Is that a shooter? Or is it like a plane simulator? That's what I think it is. Like you're running the business of an airport. Uh, let's keep that as a candidate. I'm sure you're screaming out for me to play a certain game, but just so you know, I've played the large majority of these. You know what? Let's do Demon's Crest. That's a spinoff of the Ghouls and Ghosts series, and I've never actually played this before. There we go. Let's take a look at the NES games. I haven't played Eight Eyes. Let's see. Bump and jump. There's a ton of these that I want to play again, but uh, that's not the rule for today. King's Knight. What is that? RPG. That probably wouldn't be a good one. Hmm. I think I've played most of these, except for Vegas Dream, and I don't really want to play that one. You know, a really obscure one I see here is Gary Kitchen's Battle Tank. I think Gary Kitchen is a former uh, Atari programmer. Ah, I have a feeling this will be a very bad game, but I like tanks. So let's add this to the pile. Alright, so I just have one more to go. So what system should I choose from? I've Got two for Nintendo and two for Sega so far, so I think I need to do a Sony game. Now my PS1, the laser is starting to give out, so I don't know if my original PS1 system will work, but I could play it in the PS2. Oh, let's see. Wish I could play Symphony of the Night. Command and Conquer. Critical Depth. Uh, let's see. From the developers who know vehicular combat. Ah, uh, this doesn't look good. We got Hercules Action Game. Let's see. Have I played this before? The graphics look pretty good. We'll put that as a maybe. Uh, what is this Jade Cocoon? I've forgotten about this game. This looks like something that would take a long time to learn, so... Eh, we won't do that one. Monkey Magic. Huh, looks like a 2D platformer. Rat Attack. Ugh. Yeah, this doesn't look good. There's cartoon fighting games. Uh, not a big fan of them. Wild Nine. The developers are Earthworm Jim. Bring you an intergalactic battle of good versus evil, guaranteed to reignite your passion. Oh, it allows me to torture people? Torture your enemies? We'll put it as a maybe. Uh, let's give PS2 a chance as well. Oh, let's see. Hot Shots Golf. Frequency. Have I played Frequency? What is Frequency? Eh, rhythm game. Dragon Rage. We'll keep it as a candidate. City Crisis. You know what? Let's go ahead and pick Hercules. And we'll add it to the pile. And we'll grab these. And we'll head over to the game room. And it's right across the hallway. And I gotta clean some things up. But once I get ready, we'll play these games.
the game we'll start off with is Incoming. When I first started playing this, I immediately thought it feels like an Atari Jaguar game. And if you've played the Atari Jaguar games, you'll know what I mean. Enemies are coming across a very barren landscape to destroy your base. And you're sitting in a stationary cannon trying to shoot them before they get close. Once you survive that phase, the game opens up a little bit more. FYI, I did read the instruction manuals for all the games today. It's part of my personal gaming code to do so because I think a person is more likely to enjoy a game if they have a basic understanding on how to play it. It doesn't mean you'll see me playing these games perfectly though. You're seeing my first hour or so of gameplay. In Incoming, there's aliens trying to conquer Earth and judging from what I've seen so far, you are mostly on defense. There are six locations and 10 phases in each one. As you play through those phases, you'll be operating different types of equipment. Stationary cannons, helicopters, tanks, and spaceships. That seems to be the game's core. You get to operate all those different things. While it does mix up the gameplay, it may have been better if they had just concentrated on one of those things, like the tank, which is pretty fun to operate. The stationary cannon is about as fun as it sounds. The helicopter is cumbersome to fly. It's hard to get it lined up with an enemy so you can destroy it. The developers seem to have known this because they added a lot of aim assist with the machine guns on the copter. The spaceship controls a lot better, but it's hard to hit anything with the basic weapon. It just kind of sprays all over the place. My overall impression so far is that the gameplay is repetitive, the music is generic, and there's a general lack of excitement. On more than one occasion, you grab a crate with the helicopter and just transport it to somewhere else that's about 30 seconds away. And then that completes the mission. You just move it from one place to the other. If that sounds engrossing, then this game is for you. As far as difficulty, I tore through the game until the final phase of the second location, and that's where there was a huge difficulty spike, where I died again and again. Everything I've showed you so far is the campaign mode, which the manual describes as the main mode of the game. There's also an arcade mode, which is basically the same thing, but there's a lot of power-ups laying around. Yes, this game is 22 years old, but even back then, I don't think I would have enjoyed it. Still, since the Dreamcast is one of my favorite systems, and I have a long-term goal of beating every game on it, I'm gonna stick with incoming and attempt to beat it after this video is posted. It's possible my opinion of the game will change as I get deeper into it, but I have a feeling it won't. And now for Desert Strike, which is different from Desert Strike based on the famous labor dispute. The subtitle says Return to the Gulf, which may make it sound like a sequel, but it's the first of five games in the Strike series. This game came out right when the Gulf War ended, so Return to the Gulf is just a hypothetical scenario where you have to go back into Iraq. Luckily that didn't happen, right? It may look like an action-based game where you simply fly around blowing things up, but it's much deeper than that. You can't just shoot all over the place. You have to try not to blow up civilians, or the MIAs you're trying to rescue, or your own supplies. You have to manage resources. You have to make sure that your armor doesn't get depleted, or your missiles. In order to sustain them, you have to explore a little bit and find hidden stashes of supplies. And as I mentioned, you have to rescue these MIAs. When you bring them away from the battlefield, they repair your armor. Enemies can be fought head on with guns blazing, but sometimes it's more effective to sneak up on them and take them out. You have to utilize this information screen a lot during the gameplay in order to locate things and accomplish missions. It kind of disrupts things. I'd rather just stay in the main gameplay screen as I play the game. I found the game extremely challenging. I spent most of my time on the first mission, but don't be dismayed by that because you gradually learn a pattern to take through the stage. And you also gradually memorize where all the stashes of items are. 
So as long as you're exploring and memorizing where everything's at, this game is going to get a lot easier. I love the fluid animation of the helicopter. It uses tank controls and there's potential to pull off some really cool moves once you get good at it. I mentioned the manuals to these games and I gotta say the one for this one is amazing. It has a little section where it talks about the people who worked on the game and it shows a picture of them. It also has walkthroughs for the first four missions. I plan on continuing to play Desert Strike and I may end up playing the other games in the series because I'm very curious about those. And now for Demon's Crest. This is a spin-off of the Ghouls and Ghosts franchise, and it was the third in its own franchise, preceded by Gargoyle's Quest on the Game Boy and Gargoyle's Quest 2 on the NES, none of which I've ever played. You play as Firebrand the Demon, who is battling other demons in order to collect six magical stones. As soon as you start the game, it throws you into a boss fight, and from there you traverse stages that feel like Ghouls and Ghosts stages. But there's things that set this game apart. For one, you can fly in a limited capacity at the beginning of the game. You can hover just a little bit off the ground. You can also grab the sides of things like Ninja Gaiden and strangely you can headbutt things that are in the background. <laughs> As you find magical stones and other items, your abilities expand, allowing you to do even more things. And you end up with a lot more choices on what to equip. It could be classified as a Metroidvania game. I was very surprised to learn that this is basically an RPG. There's a world map utilizing the Mode 7 abilities of the console, and there's also a flat map that can be opened with numbered locations on it. It reminds me of some other game on the Super Nintendo. Not sure which one. I found most of the opening stages to be very easy. There was a little bit more challenge at the boss fights, but when you lose at those boss fights, it doesn't send you back too far. So you just keep playing them again and again and adjust your tactics and the things you have equipped and eventually you'll pass them. What stands out is the graphics and the music. You can tell Capcom put a lot of love into every inch of this game. Fans of Castlevania and Ghouls and Ghosts are going to like it. But I'm a bit hesitant to keep on playing this game right now because with the RPG elements, it looks like it's going to be a big time commitment. But as a huge Ghouls and Ghosts fan, I predict I will be playing this game again at some point. Up next is Battle Tank. I realize now I subconsciously picked three games that have a tank in them. I'm not sure what that says about me. Maybe next time I'll pick tanks but no tanks. I said earlier that I thought Gary Kitchen was a former Atari 2600 programmer and I was right. His most famous game on the 2600 is Keystone Capers. Battle Tank is a very basic tank simulator. You drive toward a target, you destroy it, and you move on. There's a lot of things going on with the HUD, but I did find it easy to pick up and play. I knew within minutes how to move forward, how to toggle weapons, and how to change the angle of the turret. What the game suffers from is a lot of dead space. If the first three stages are any indication, the land you're driving around on is 99% empty. If it wasn't for the map screen that you call up, I would have run out of gas before I found any enemies. It actually lets you drive the tank while you have that map pulled up. You could theoretically play the entire game from it. I noticed that the tank moves very fast on that screen. A lot faster than it's actually traveling on the main screen. I would drive up to an enemy using the map and then switch to the main screen, and it still took a little bit more driving before I found the enemy. It was like the map was out of sync with what was happening in the game. But then I read the manual, and it all made sense after that. The map screen allows for fast travel, basically. You're supposed to use it to move yourself from point to point. 
It's like the developers knew players would get bored as they traveled the empty landscape in real time. In fact, the manual pretty much says it. Traveling great distances in the battle screen will take too long. Battle Tank is not a game I'm going to continue to play for obvious reasons, but back in the days when the NES was on the market, I probably would have gotten some enjoyment out of it. Interestingly, Gary Kitchen ended up creating two sequels to this game, Super Battle Tanks 1 and 2, both on the Super Nintendo. I'll give it to him, he was very dedicated to the tank simulator genre. And lastly, we have Hercules Action Game. Why they put such a generic term after Hercules is beyond me. Were people going to get it mixed up with Hercules Shoot'em Up? Hercules RPG or Hercules puzzle game? I mentioned earlier there was a problem with the laser in my PS1. I was able to get the game started and the opening cutscenes ran fine, but once I started playing it, it froze. So I ended up putting it in my PS2 and I was pleasantly surprised. This game looks wonderful. I should mention I'm unfamiliar with Disney's Hercules movie, which this is based on, but that didn't matter to me. They went against the normal PS1 trend and actually used a lot of bright colors. How dare they? I want to be miserable when I play PS1. The fundamentals are all solid. The voices, the animation, the combat, the 2.5D graphics. There's all these little details going on in the background and the foreground. My first impression is that this is a remarkable game. However, I wasn't able to play it for very long because the PS2 stopped reading the disc. I've never had trouble with my PS2 before and I don't want to push it. So I wasn't able to put as much time into Hercules as I did the other games today. So to make up for it, I grabbed Dragon Rage for the PS2 and I played that a little bit. You're a dragon who barely escapes execution from the orcs and now you're pissed off and you want to destroy them all. Upon starting the first stage, I was suddenly reminded of one of the worst things about games of the PS2 era. Excessively long tutorials. This one was 25 minutes long. The voice work in that tutorial is so bad, it destroys the dark mood of the game it's trying to establish. Activate your dragon power and you will glow the color of your element. With your fire dragon power active, Shoot a fireball and take out the whole squad. And I swear that voice sounds familiar. With rollover data, the data you don't use this month rolls over to the next month. And I don't have to do anything. Not a thing. Mobile Sure Value customers get it automatically. It's how we show appreciation. Hover in front of the orc targets to use your dragon power of reflection. The whole time I was playing this tutorial, I was just begging for some freedom to be able to fly where I wanted and destroy what I wanted. What makes the tutorial so long is also the main strength of the game. It's the massive distances that you get to fly around in. When she tells you to destroy a target, you have to circle around and get the approach just right. It chews up a lot of time and the targets are so tiny. After you destroy them, you don't feel fulfilled because you basically stomped on an ant. But the dragon is huge and having all this room to fly in, it kind of gave me this epic feel. Eating orcs refills your magic, eating animals refills your health. When it comes to cows, the game gets kind of strange. When you kill them, you can return their souls to a shrine where you gain additional abilities. It's kind of odd how much work they put into this aspect of the game, but yeah, you gotta cash in the cows. When the tutorial finally ended, I got what I wanted. I was able to freely fly around and destroy everything in sight. The ground was littered with orcs and their installations, and you can blow them all up. They should have started the game like this. But my experience was short-lived because like Hercules before it, Dragon Rage began to malfunction. Right now, I don't know enough to declare this a good game, but it did seem to turn a corner after that tutorial. I'm gonna revisit Dragon Rage at some point in the future. In the meantime, the PS1 and PS2 are going to go under the knife 
and if I can't fix them, I'm going to replace them. Old game equipment breaks down. That's just part of collecting. But we must persist in keeping it up and running, and we need to keep discussing all these games. They are basically memories, created by game developers, either burned into a chip or etched onto a disc. And just like the memories in our heads, they can be forgotten if we don't reflect upon them from time to time. Have a good day, everybody.